Pilot Boys in the building. Welcome to the Pilot Boys podcast, where you'll get the real on all things sports, music, and pop culture. I'm Mecca Don here with my co-host, V. Think about auditioning for a Geico Caveman commercial once this is all over. <laughs> Today is March 26, 2020. Thank you guys for tuning in. I know you can be anywhere in the world, but you're here with us. We are quarantined and social distancing due to this coronavirus pandemic, but we're still going to figure out a way to bring you content at all costs. On today's show, we'll do some news and notes of popular sports, music, and pop culture stories from around the country, from the coronavirus impact on sports in the market, Tom Brady, Cam Newton, Ohio State, Jay Electronica, DJ D. Nice, the NCAA, Bill Gates, and more. Shout out to our Patreon subscribers. Remember now that our $5 and up Patreon subscribers will get our episodes on Wednesdays, a night early. These donations help keep our show going. If you want to help keep us on air, especially during these trying times, you can donate at www.patreon.com forward slash Pilot Boys Podcast. Let's go. Where the Pilot Boys at? Pilot Boys, we get on up. We gon' fly, boys, we get up. Love the Pilot Boys podcast? Support us on Patreon. Supporters can pledge as little as $1. And we have some cool perks on there. Check out www.patreon.com forward slash Pilot Boys podcast. Show us some love today. You're listening to episode 20 of the Pilot Boys podcast. V, let's hit some news and notes. <laughs> Obviously, we've been quarantined, uh, so we're doing our best obviously, to bring a show. But we have a lot of stuff to talk about, so let's let's just jump right into it. Let's go. My beard's getting getting nice and long over here. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Uh, those are when the survival skills come in handy. Uh, so let's talk about Tom Brady, man. You know, Tom Brady, I mean, you know, we talked about it a few shows back, and, you know, we talked about the possibility of him, you know, not coming back to the Patriots. A lot of people said, oh, there's no way. It's just posturing. And I was like, man, I, I think that could happen, especially when you look at kind of a lot of how um, some of the other top quarterbacks in the in the league, you know, in the history of the NFL have ended their career, from Peyton Manning to Joe Montana to Brett Favre. They've all kind of left and wanted to seek their own new destiny. What are your thoughts about, one, him leaving um, New England, obviously, and then, two, his likely success in Tampa Bay? Um, they say all, thing, all good things must come to an end, right? So. Mm -hmm. The fact that he played for one team in the NFL for 20 years is is something that's in itself a huge accomplishment, right? Most teams and players don't stay together for that that long of a period of time. Right. Um, we even had a guy like Joe Montana having to go end his career in Kansas City. And I think this is just a case of it being the yeah. right time. The Patriots as an organization want to stay competitive um, and don't want to have a lapse in competitiveness. I think a couple of years back, they wanted to probably, Belichick probably wanted to move on or have a plan of moving on with Garoppolo. And I think that caused um, the initial tension and the Patriots were unwilling to commit to Tom Brady long term. And he felt like that was needed and it was time for him to maybe try something new before he ended his career. I think, you know, the Patriots loss is an exciting opportunity for them, for the Buccaneers. Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of things. I think, you know, Belichick and Brady, and this will probably come out, and some of it has already started to come out a little bit. I think they both kind of want to prove to the world that they can win without each other. Um, and it's it's an unfortunate thing that happens in, in groups. And we talked about this before in a different context. Unfortunate thing that kind of happens in groups, right? Like people start to you know, be so inextricably tied to each other that at times, you know, they want to kind of prove to the world, like, look, yes, I respect the other person. I love what they've done, but I can do this thing without you. And so this is going to be a, a test. You know, obviously the Patriots signed Brian Hoyer again. I don't think that's their long-term plan, but we'll, we'll see what happens there. And speaking of quarterbacks, I mean, there's a lot of quarterback movement actually um, in the NFL. I mean, you have Cam, Cam Newton was just released. Um, Teddy Bridgewater got signed by the Carolina Panthers. Phillip Rivers is on the move. He's on the uh, sign with the Colts. Um, PJ, PJ Walker um, also signed with the Panthers, uh, who's the XFL star. 
Uh, there are a few quarterback situations on the move. What are the ones that stand out to you most intriguing? Well, outside of Brady going to um, going to Tampa Bay, one of the more intriguing moves, and there's some big name ones, but is Nick Foles going to the Bears? Right, Nick, he, Nick Foles to the Bears. Nick Foles to the Bears. It's yeah. not the most popular one or most trending one, but I thought it was a, a fairly interesting move when you dig a little bit deeper into it because. If you look at the Bears' offense and the Eagles' offense, basically it's an extension of the Andy Reid um, coaching tree and coaching philosophy. And a player like Nick, who thrived in Philadelphia in that system, this might be a unique opportunity for him where he gets to redeem himself from last year and go into a system he's comfortable with and thrived in. That's That was one of the more intriguing moves, as well as, as the Panthers moving on to moving on to Teddy Bridgewater, mainly because of what Cam means to that franchise. It may not be as long of a, a relationship as Brady has had with the, with the Patriots, but when you think of the Carolina Panthers, the first thing you think about is Cam Newton. And now, what do you think, what do you think Cam, Cam ends up now? I would love to see him in New England. I don't know if that doesn't seem like a New England type of move, but it would be interesting to see Belichick take on a quarterback like Cam, who's very different than Brady and succeed with him. I think he's proven that he can succeed with anyone, right? He had Matt Castle who had never played a college game and they took the Patriots to 11 wins. So I'm not sure if he will make a splash like him, but that's where I'd like him to see. Obviously San Diego seems like the most Los logical. Angeles. Los Angeles. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I know, right? I still do that too. I'm sure they, they would rather be in San Diego than Los Angeles during these times. So. I know, right? I'm sure he's going to end up – I think he's going to end up with the Chargers, but we will definitely see. And obviously his health plays into that. And speaking of the quarterback moves, um, the Browns signed Case Keenum. Actually, the Browns have made a, a few signings, Austin Hooper, which was the big one. They've made a couple other splashes in, in free agency, and they also signed – Case Keenum, I don't think it's a, a, a doomsday kind of signing for uh, Baker Mayfield that, that there's impending trouble and, and that there's going to be some type of quarterback competition. But I do think that, first of all, I, I respect the move highly because the amount of talent that the Browns have, if and, you know, first of all, if anything happens to Baker Mayfield injury wise, you got to have somebody that can come in that's a competent quarterback that can come in and still make that offense go. And then number two, if, if Baker is not who a lot of people think he is and continues to struggle and you, you know, you're kind of in the thick of things mid season or late season and you have to make a move, you know, Case Kingdom is not a bad option. So I really actually like that signing for the Browns. What did you feel about it? Yeah, I really like the Case Kingdom signing. I think it's important to have a serviceable serviceable backup as we've seen in many years recently when when the QB goes down, when there's a good quarterback behind him they can come in and make a difference um, a little bit less excited about the Austin Hooper signing mm-hmm. obviously, but uh, I think the case Keenum one was a solid logical, logical move. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing about the Browns is that they have so much talent um, and they have, they have good talent for cheap right now too. I mean, Baker obviously was first pick, but he's still not making 30 million a year. You got Nick Chubb and Kareem hunt, both essentially at discounts in my mind. Um, so they have a little bit more money to spend, you know, for the type of talent that they have, they shouldn't necessarily have that type of money. Right. Um, but they yep. do have that type of money just based on kind of the current construction of their team. So they could kind of spend a little bit more on Austin Hooper. And I do think Austin Hooper is dynamic and could bring some, um, bring some viability to the offense, but we will see one last thing on in the NFL before we move on. <laughs> what in the hell is Bill O'Brien doing with the Houston Texans. I mean, you trade away DeAndre Hopkins, you know, you get, you know, you get uh, David Johnson in return and some draft pick stuff. When Todd Gurley hits the open market, by the way, who signed with the Falcons, another big signing. Todd Gurley was just a free agent. You could have just gone and signed him. What is he doing out there? There are all kinds of reports that he has problems with players and, you know, he compared DeAndre Hopkins to to, um, uh, Aaron Hernandez and just different stuff. What is going on? I know you lived in Houston. Tell us what you're hearing. Well, in, in Ohio, we're very familiar with uh, ineptitude when it comes to our professional football organizations like the Browns <laughs> and Bengals, but we're probably only matched um, by the Houston Texans. Houston Texans fans have dealt with very similar issues with their management and ownership as we have. Um, 
I don't know what it is, what their organizational philosophy is, the ownership, but they give their personnel people almost unchecked control. It happened with Rick Smith before this when he was the GM. He pretty much could do anything and he would keep his job no matter what. And it seems to be carrying over with Bill O'Brien. Oftentimes, the only the only successful GM slash coach we have in the NFL is Bill Belichick. Um, and that's because there is there is organization in 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 the organization itself. Mm-hmm. Bill O'Brien has made several several head scratching moves and shows that he just doesn't understand what being a GM is. And I think also he lets his personal feelings get in the way. You know, that Laramie Tunsil deal, he gave up the house for him last year and then this year. You saw with the Stefan Diggs trade, who isn't even at nearly the level He's a great receiver, but not nearly the level of DeAndre Hopkins getting a first-round pick. DeAndre Hopkins, if you are going to trade him, you better get two first-round picks because guys like him, top three receiver, don't just walk through the door. Yeah, so I think, you know, as a Houston fan, I mean, you know, people say they're frustrated as Browns fans. I can't even imagine being a Houston fan because you're seeing them actually just lose talent after talent piece after talent piece. Um, and just it looks like they're almost crashing and burning their franchise, and you know, especially. And they were good last year, you know. Yeah, and that's the and thing. Yeah, Deshaun not, Watson. Yep. So who's he gonna? And and their number one quarterback now is a guy that hasn't gotten through a full season ever. Um, yeah, just, and then you have Will Fuller, who's amazing, but he he he's hurt. You have Kiki Kuti, who was hurt. You have a lot of receivers who don't even haven't even made it through the season. But you know, Jalen Strong, who was a former receiver there, Devere Posey, who went to Ohio State, one of our boys. They all came out on social media saying that Bill O'Brien was a bozo, basically. So this isn't something that we should be surprised about. But it's interesting. It is interesting to see what DeAndre Hopkins will look like in the Arizona uniform. Um, Larry Fitzgerald on the other side, Christian Kirk, a lot of the young. They have a lot of young, talented receivers as well. Um, and then obviously I Kenny mean, Drake and Marks last year. So that offense should be dynamic in Arizona. If 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 DeAndre Hopkins can make Ryan Mallett look like a look like a star, man, <laughs> he's going to do with Kyler Murray. Exactly. All right, V, let's move on to some Ohio State stuff. Um, football, Ohio State football. Obviously, there's some coronavirus implications in football, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But I do want to talk about the football aspect of things. Ohio State just got Trey Sermon uh, from the transfer portal. Trey Sermon was uh, running back to Oklahoma, very talented. He's coming to Ohio State now as a graduate transfer. And, you know, on a different show, we had this conversation about, you know, what weaknesses potentially Ohio State had, particularly on offense. And one of the things that we had mentioned was the running back situation. Obviously, losing J.K. Dobbins, someone as talented as him, Master Teague being injured and not knowing what his timeline is, timeline, excuse me, and then obviously Crowley being injured. You know, there was kind of a thin, thin prospect at, at running back, but now you get Trey Sermon. What were your th- thoughts when you heard about that, and what do you think he does for the offense? Well, I think, again, it's a, it's a home run. Um, Ohio State's program seems to be doing everything right, and what I mean by that is that they are recognizing their holes and their potential weaknesses and finding ways to address them. Now, somebody like Trey Sermon coming available almost seems like a miracle because we're getting a guy who's actually proven himself and is talented, but also has experience, um, which is which is needed in that in that position group right now. And um, just an amazing, amazing hit. Yeah. And, and that's the thing, you know, like you said, I think you're right. Like him being available almost seems like destiny in a way right if you believe in that given first of all how state's running back situation given his level of talent and experience uh he can literally just come and plug right into that offense and be successful uh and you know so i just think it's just like you said a home run you know another another win for ryan day ryan day is kicking ass in the 2021 recruiting um he's kicking ass in the transfer portal obviously justin fields you know came over trey sermon came over i mean this, these are big big names and he's grabbing these guys. So, you know, it really bodes well for the, the Ohio State program, not to mention running backs coming in uh, next year and a couple guys that we're still looking at. I mean, this is this, this is big. So, you know, obviously we hope the season happens this year. That's another issue. But uh, if if it does, this is a big deal. One other thing on Ohio State, not football, but basketball, DJ Carton actually announced that he's leaving the program and he ent- entered the transfer portal. And that's particularly sad because, you know, I think a lot of Ohio State people rooted for him. Um, you know, he announced earlier, you know, midway through the season, essentially, that he was having some mental health problems and he was going to take time away. Um, everybody was, you know, fairly supportive of that. 
and now he's he's entering the portal. Um, any thoughts on that, or is it just you know kind of business as usual in 2020, basically? I think it's uh, to speculate. You know, I would assume that this would would relate somehow to the issues that he's facing, and hopefully, he finds a situation that's 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 better suited for him. It's a, he was a big recruit and a big loss, but um, on on a, a good note, we were able to to get a replacement in the kid that we have coming over from Harvard. So, right, yeah, exactly. So that's that's all you know, and that's so Chris Holtman is obviously. You know, he's never going to rest. Um, I really, really respect what it is that he's doing. I think attrition is part of college sports and athletics, period. I think that's something that we've always seen. And I think now with the transfer portal, again, we've talked about this before. I think we'll see a lot of this, a lot more of this thing happening. And, um, you know, as a, as a fan, you kind of just have to brace yourself and realize that this is going to happen, you know, and, and just kind of, you know, be ready to move on. Let's One talk thing a little one thing that was disappointing about it was I follow a little bit on social media that a lot of fans um, took shots at him. Um, yeah. I, I think I think that that's considering you're you're dealing with a kid who's already on record for having some issues. Um, that's not the right thing to do, and hopefully fans fans calm yeah, down. That's bullshit. That. In fact, he said that he was gonna delete his social media as a result of just the vicious stuff that people were saying. That shit drives me crazy when I see that type of stuff. So, you know, but, you know, that is kind of the way of the world nowadays. And I think, um, you know, these programs have to actually do, you know, we've heard Ohio State does a good job of this, but these programs have to do a good job of actually helping these these guys deal with that type of stuff because that type of stuff is coming. Um, and, you know, no matter how much you call people out on social media, they're still going to do it. So, yeah, that's sad, but we wish them all the best. Uh, let's move on. Let's move on to the coronavirus as it as it affect affecting sports. Right. And I mean, there's just so many layers here. Honestly, these discussions will probably go on indefinitely, but there are a couple kind of things that are interesting about it. Obviously you have, you know, some basketball players and um, that have tested positive, you know, Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell, Kevin Durant, you have uh, even Sean Payton, the head coach of the Saints has tested positive. Um, then that's led to obviously all the shutdowns, right? So everything shut down, the Masters, Boston Marathon, NCAA championships, NBA, NHL, MLB, and now the Olympics is going to be postponed. And the reality is, you know, depending on the kind of the trajectory of of this thing, football has a chance of being impacted, right? Um, so, the, you know, there are a lot of things, but th there there are some good things that have also come out of this, right? You've seen some communities band together. Mark Cuban has been very involved and vocal about trying to come up with a financial package to help their employees. And you have guys like Kevin Love and Zion Williamson and Blake Griffin and others who are pledging money, you know, even before the fucking owners did, um, pledging money to try to help employees. And, um, you know, the NCAA has stepped in, at least as it comes to spring athletes and said, um, you know, that they'll give red shirts to spring athletes. There's not a word on what will happen with winter athletes yet. But, you know, where where, where do we even go from here? How do, how do we evaluate this whole thing as it relates to sports? I mean, we've all wondered aloud what life would be like if there were no sports, right? This usually happens in the dog days of summer after basketball season's over and, and we're stuck with three and a half hour baseball games, like I can't wait for football season. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But I think uh, during this time, it is um, good to see that um, during times of crisis, that the things that we think matter so much um, don't matter quite as much. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully we see the other side of this thing. Um, I was excited for the basketball playoffs. I was excited for March Madness. I don't think in either of our lifetimes have we seen sporting events at this level that we look forward to every year just being postponed or canceled, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm particularly sad for the kids who were seniors at Ohio State and other places are playing their last year to, to not get that last, or in some cases, some of these freshmen who are leaving for that, the only time to play in a tournament like March Madness. Mm -hmm. um, specifically because we hear a lot of the reason that kids go to college and don't go straight to the pros is for the experience right. that you get as as an amateur athlete. And um, it will be interesting to see what what the fallout is. The one thing that's going strong is NFL free agency, right? That's like yeah. the, biggest, <laughs> the biggest news out right now. Right. Yeah, and, you know, the thing is for me, I think – you know, obviously, I think that was this was the right thing to do, um, particularly because we just didn't have enough information on this. There's no treatment. There's no vaccine. 
a ton of people are getting infected and, and the way that it looks it appears that um it's 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 highly contagious i mean much more contagious than other things so it's just an unfortunate kind of reality and the thing is is that's a little also annoying from a sports perspective only right obviously we respect the the seriousness of this thing from a health perspective but you know the olympics right so that's you know the summer you know it's kind of like the dog days of sports right i mean yeah if you're a baseball fan maybe not so much but if you're not you're just kind of waiting for football season to come so when you actually have the olympics it's great because it's like yes you know it's just another thing that can help get me closer to football season and now you have that being postponed and you know it's just it's just on that one that one particularly is is when you look at what the athletes, they train for four years and they're getting into this kind of final stretch of, of preparing for this. Now they have another year um, that they have to go back and, and train, train for a full another year for something they've been training for for four years. Right. And you know, so. what's crazy too, is that, you know, with the, and this is probably true in all sports, but you know, it's definitely true in the Olympics as well is that, you know, there's some people who this is kind of their last year, you know what I mean? It's kind of like their last rodeo. You know, so a whole other year of being older, right, can, can really add strain to to their ability to compete at that high of a level, right? And so yeah, that's just no, another yeah. unfor- unfortunate kind of byproduct of this thing. And you know, but again, like we said, not not everything from this is obviously this is you know a very you know weird and and, and bad situation. But there are some also positive things that have come out of out of this. Like for example, DJ D Nice, right? He created Club Quarantine on his Instagram, which is essentially him just being a live, a live DJ playing the jams. And I mean, the, the, I think the first day he did it, he hit a hundred thousand live viewers. I mean, Michelle Obama was in there. Oprah was in there, you know, all the big names were in there, um, watching. And then the next day, I think he even hit up more than that 150,000, just providing good, good vibes for people. And then Anthony Hamilton is doing stuff and quest love is doing stuff. And, you know, it's just I think a lot of creatives are being very creative and taking advantage of this situation as well. Yeah, I mean, it's good to see um, the creatives providing finding ways to provide entertainment. And also it's great that we have platforms in which we can digest this entertainment. Um, everything's not all bad. As, as I said, you know, I've, I've, I've spent time in India where the power has been out for 12 hours straight for the most part we should be thankful for the the fact that we do have our homes and wi-fi and and phones to be able to continue to entertain ourselves and 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 also um engage with other human beings in in real ways even if they're not person to person yeah and and speaking of entertainment too um you know jay electronica you know he finally dropped an album a written testimony and you know, it's 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 funny because, you know, if you're a hip hop fan, you probably never thought it was going to happen. It's kind of like, you know, Dre's album, right? Like, you just don't think it's ever going to happen. But he finally did it. And, you know, I enjoyed it. I, I liked it. I liked a couple of the tracks on there. I thought Jay-Z was on there floating. I thought he was rapping, you know, as good as he's, he's ever rapped. But there's been some criticism that Jay Electronica has received um, from people. The most public one is probably from Joe Budden, basically saying, this is a Jay Z mixtape. You know, Jay Z smoked, <laughs> smoked, smoked, smoked you on your own. Take you off. This is a Jay Z mixtape. Jay Z smoked you on your own album. You know, what were your thoughts about the album? What are your thoughts about kind of that kind of criticism as well? Yeah, Joe Bo- Joe Budden never misses an opportunity to criticize everyone by himself, right? So, <laughs> um, I think you know one thing I said was that maybe we should all make him wait ten years to listen to it since he's made us wait ten years. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years for it to come out. Right, right, um, right. He is a, it's all, it's interesting. He's a 43 year old rapper, but I think in terms of what he raps about and what his lane is, um, there's not much difference between him being 43 and 33. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just don't know if the market is the same for him or if he even cares. The thing that I've wondered is how has he stayed afloat financially for the last decade. I think he married some rich. I think he ra- married a, a billionaire, um, some billionaire woman. I'm Maybe he gets sure. child support, child support from Erica Badu too. But <laughs> yeah. I've always wondered how is this guy making money. I really money? do think that. I do think he did marry a billionaire. Woman. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm not kidding. Yeah. That makes sense. That helps a lot. So. Yeah. I guess it might be the only album we ever get from. Did you so, like the album? Did you like it? I like parts of it. Yeah. Um, there were probably two 
a three songs, but as, as you know, when he dropped the exit, the, the tracks with just blaze, we, the world was waiting for him to drop something like how Kend- the anticipation for Kendrick Lamar was, yeah. is what we anticipated. I don't think it met those expectations. And I do think to be fair to Joe Budden, I do think he leaned heavily on Jay Z um, to support him through this, through the album, and I would have preferred if if it was more hearing of uh, Jay Electronica. I think Jay Z right. stood out more, but Jay Electronica was obviously very good, and he's an extremely talented rapper, and he did well on the album. Yeah, and at this time now, you know, I think he released it a little bit before this coronavirus thing started taking over. You have you know Lady Gaga and some other people who are postponing their albums, um, particularly because it's marketing and and performing obviously is. Is a is a hard time. One other thing I want to ask you um, about um, about kind of the coronavirus and celebrities is is Cardi B. She she made a claim that she feels like celebrities are being paid to say that they have the coronavirus. And when I first heard it, I was annoyed because I was just like, don't make light of this thing. You know, like even if you think that there's no point to really say it because you know people who are really researching and reading on this thing realize how serious this is and. If that's what it's going to take to get, you know, you see people not social distancing, you see people still going to the parties and the clubs and the beaches. If that's what it's going to take to get people to pay attention, then it's fine. But I still thought it was, it was, it was interesting. What do you have any thoughts on that at all? I mean, there's, there's celebrities and uh, and athletes um, who say we don't take them seriously enough. Um, this was definitely a black eye for, for, for that, that, <laughs> that, that hope. But I think, you know, if, if you're taking Cardi B seriously, um, then you might need to reevaluate yourself. She is there. She is more of a com- comic relief for an entertainment for people. So her positions or her thoughts on, on serious issues should be taken with a grain of salt. And I don't, I don't necessarily think we should be overly criticizing her. But, you know, these, these conspiracy theories always come up during times like this of, Hey, these people are being paid, but you always have to ask your question. Ask yourself the question of, what do they have to gain from yeah. this? Um, and and that's just attention, attention, you attention. Know. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and then, so I, you want to And I do think that some of these, I've heard of some of these celebrities coming out and making light of it and acting like they have it to, mm-hmm. to gain attention from their fans. So they do. There is some of that. Yeah. happening but i don't think i mean nothing some conspiracy me. yeah that, pe- that they're being paid to do it some of them are doing it to generate attention around themselves I, I was, you know i remember they said the same thing about magic johnson that he was paid to say that he had hiv um because you know they really needed a spokesperson at that time given how prevalent and dangerous it was you know and so those are the claims that you're going to hear people make i guess all the time when, when things like this happen but you but you and i you know we've done our fact checking and we know and are connected to people who are really getting sick and really facing issues with this oh no I, this, know, this. I know somebody personally who's in critical condition personally in critical condition yeah. who's my age so in new york so for people to not take this thing seriously is mind-boggling and again i you know there are a number of different perspectives to talk about this from i don't think every single thing that we should talk about should be you know, doom and gloom. And that's one thing you and I have done a good job of, you know, one of the, some of the other things that are happening that are good. You have schools that are offering free meals. Um, Ohio state and some other schools are offering refunds on tuition. You know, the people are banding together. You have um, rogue fitness, Columbus company that's stepping up. Elon Musk is stepping up and helping to try to produce some of the. Ford just announced that they're, they're going to start building respirators and equipment as well. Yeah. I mean, those are the type of things that I think are, are important. Uh, to make sure that we highlight as well, right? It's not just, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, what do we do? Um, but there are, you know, this is an opportunity, I think, for, you know, the country, different parts of the country, private sector, government, individuals, families to kind of band together and, um, you know, make a positive change. And I think, um, you know, at, at, we'll end this segment, we'll, you and I will give kind of our, you know, three coronavirus quarantine tips. Um, but I think, you know, it's important to kind of make sure that we also keep a positive note and highlight some of the positive things that are happening. But I do, <laughs> right as I say that, I'm going to switch to something that's kind of crazy. I do want to know your perspective on the markets uh, as it pertains to this coronavirus. Obviously, you know, you went to Fisher uh, at Ohio State University and got a business degree. And then you obviously got your MBA and you have a, a pretty good understanding of, of the markets and, and this, you know, potential recession and, and how it relates to other recessions. Just wanted to get your kind of thoughts on that um, before we get out of here. 
Yeah, I've spent a lot of time talking to people who are, who are way smarter than I am in this area. Um, I know enough not to be dangerous. Right. Uh, I always like to say, but in, in most things, it's it's good to have a network of people who are very knowledgeable on this and have done some research on it. Um, and we are in very, very unique times um, in where we're at with the market and what's happening in the market. Obviously, everyone knows that the stock market is crashing, um, but there are things that make this very different um, than 2008 because this the economy actually is shut down. This isn't bad decision making or a recession hitting. This is this is just businesses being shut down and not operating. Mm-hmm. And so that's created some some very unique um, signals in the markets, right? Typically, right. there are two classes of assets. Um, we're separated into riskier assets, which are the equities and stocks that um, you, you hear about on the market, like owning shares of Apple. And then there's another lower risk assets, which are usually considered treasury bonds, which are ba- backed by the U.S. government. Um, right in, in normal markets, um, the riskier assets, the stocks, have positive correlations with each other, which means their prices move together. And the less risky assets, the treasury bonds, have positive correlations to each other as well, which means their prices move together. Um, but the two assets typically have very little correlation to each other. And this has been generally true for decades. Now, during times of panic, like 2008, um, obviously the positive correlation amongst the risky assets like stocks gets stronger, which means our prices move together. And the negative correlation between the risky assets and the long-term U.S. treasuries like the bonds gets stronger. So what usually happens during times of crisis is people move their money out of equities and the stocks and riskier assets into the less risky bonds um, until the crisis subsides. Mm-hmm. However, during the coronavirus, we're seeing some things that we've never seen before, right? There is an unexpected positive correlation between the risky assets and the less risky assets, meaning at the stocks and bonds now, their prices are moving together, whereas in typical disasters, the money goes from the risky assets to the less risky assets, and there isn't a correlation between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what economists are saying is so concerning about this particular crisis. And honestly, we don't have what it means. We don't know yeah. because there isn't data to support support it. But it is definitely um, definitely a scary market situation and not similar to other recessions um, that we faced. And hopefully we can get the economy moving, right. um, moving again because this country is very dependent on the market's moving and the economy moving. Well, you know, another thing, you know, so from, from a legal perspective, I, you know, I've analyzed this thing a number of different ways from a legal perspective, right? And I think there are a couple of things that I think are important that we will see uh, play out. First of all, there are going to be a ton of lawsuits when this thing subsides. I mean, tons and tons of lawsuits from multiple different sides. Um, and it's going to be interesting. We're actually going to see what they call force majeure, basically, uh, provisions, doomsday provisions that are in contracts that are just kind of like boilerplate. They're kind of standard. They're in every contract. But we're actually going to see those things start to get invoked. And, and what those provisions are, you've probably seen them before. It says basically something to the extent of like if by nature or force or an act of God something happens, it, it um, you know, removes your kind of obligation to perform, right? And typically, you know, that's a, you know, like a flood just, you know, floods your whole office and, and removes all your materials or, you know, a tornado tears down your building, you know, things that generally don't happen. But yep. this is one of those things. This has to, this has to be considered one of those things. And again, the specific provisions are, they vary from contract to contract, but some contracts don't even have them. They're just certain things that be, become implied, but it now changes. So for example, if you're a supplier, you know, and someone, you know, needs X amount of whatever, but your business has been shut down, you can invoke this kind of provision. So I think those type of things are going to be things that we're going to see many different people fighting about as this thing continues to go forward. Um, And then the other side of this thing too, I think is also kind of what will people like the kind of the NCAA and eligibility and um, all those type of things, you know, where, where do we going to see happen as this thing kind of comes out and we start to get back to normal 
um, and the NCA starts making different decisions on who's eligible and who's not, and you know what circumstances and all that type of stuff. There's gonna be there's gonna be a big mess, uh, unfortunately, at the end of this thing, from from that standpoint too. So those are just a couple things. Obviously, we wanted to talk about to make people, you know, keep people abreast of. Um, but this thing is going to continue developing. I mean, literally day by day. The, the the lesson that I would say for people to take away from a financial standpoint is whether you're making minimum wage or you're making a hundred dollars an hour, to th- to to understand that things like this can happen, um, and whatever portion of your of of money you can save for a rainy day that you try to try to start building up a fund. So when things like this happen. Um, you are in a good situation to handle it and, and survive. Yeah. And, you know, one other thing that, you know, you know, with regard to social distancing and why it's important to not take it lightly is, you know, the, first of all, the more the more seriously we all take social distancing, the less we're going to have to do it. Right. Because essentially this is all about flattening the curve. You probably heard that a lot. And essentially this is just it's, it's math and it's fairly simple compounding math. And that's the thing that I think people have to understand about this particular virus as it relates to the population is that it's very contagious. And there's a guy that did a video about this that was very succinct that essentially said, you know, if, you know, this is the virus that you can pass to, you know, three, three, four people, and then that can, they can pass it to their X amount of people. And each individual person can end up being responsible for passing it to like 60,000 people if they don't social distance. And that's the reason why the math, that's why I keep seeing the numbers go up. First of all, it's testing is going up. So that's, it's not just, the compounding aspect, but that's the reason why social distancing is important. This it's not because we're saying, oh, we're going to get rid of this virus and it's going to be gone. No, it's not going to be gone. But if you can reduce the numbers and you can reduce the burden on the healthcare system, and that can save more lives, not just with people who are coming in with COVID-19, but even people who are coming in with other, for example, if you have 30 emergency room beds and you have a hundred people coming in and, you know, some of them have COVID, some of them have gunshot wounds, some of them have appendicitis, who are you going to treat? How are you going to decide? Yep. So that's the reason why um, people should take this seriously. One last thing before you and I get to our our final thoughts, which is basically our three uh, coronavirus quarantine tips from each of us. You already touched on one of yours, I, I assume. But one thing that, that's also important that, that happened that's huge is Bill Gates stepping down from Microsoft, um, the board of Microsoft. And, you know, the timing of this is interesting. Les Wexner also, you know, stepped down. That's, you know, potentially different because of all the stuff going on there, but Bill Gates stepping down, you know, what were your thoughts on that? Do you think it's significant in any way or is it, you know, his work essentially done there and he'll be back, you know, just doing his stuff with his foundation? I think in in recent times, I think Bill Gates has has been talking about um, spending more time with, with his, his foundation's efforts and and moving out of the the public sector. Um, I think he's left Microsoft in strong hands. I don't know what it signals. Him stepping down from the board. He also stepped down from the board of Berkshire Hathaway and other boards that he was on. Um, you know, he's actually been one of the. He he actually predicted um, a situation like this happening um, a few years back, and has 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 spent a lot of time advocating for the U.S. and other countries to be prepared for a pandemic like this. Um, obviously, has fall on fallen on deaf ears for the most part to our government. Not just now, but in years past. Um, so I don't think it means a lot. I do think hopefully Bill Gates, we see Bill Gates running for president in 2024. That's my hope. <laughs> All <laughs> right. So before we get out of here, um, you know, I, you know, I, like I just said, we, we wanted to give kind of some of our coronavirus quarantine tips. Again, you know, this is obviously a very, um, you know, trying time for a lot of people. You know, there's there's some there's some mental health, uh, emotional aspect. There's obviously a big financial aspect. There's there's a fear for the future. Um, what does this mean for me and my career and my job and all those type of things? I think those are all very very valid concerns. But like we said earlier, um, you know, all does not have to be bad from this. And so I have three tips that I think you know will be helpful for people. Uh, I think this is a good time to do different things, right? So my first one is to learn some greetings, at least in a new language, right? I think, you know, the world is becoming more and more global. And as you can see, right, we're all connected, whether we like it or not, you can shut as many borders as you want. We're all still connected. And, you know, so there's opportunity to, if there's opportunity to learn some new, new greetings or new words, a new language, I think that's a great thing. That's one. 
Uh, number two, I think is this is a great time to build on the little things in your life and in your business. Uh, you know, little things that you've neglected, whether it was, you know, you know, fixing your, your website or, you know, you know, working on little things that uh, you hadn't really done before, maybe your diet or your, you know, your exercise regimen or whatever it is. And I think this is definitely an opportunity to come out stronger. There will, will be people who come out of this stronger than before. So, you know, it's a good time to try to be one of those people. And then my third thing, a little personal, go listen to all that Mechadon music that you missed on Apple and Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube. Go stream my music, man. Get familiar. If you're a fan, you probably already know a lot of it. If you're not, go check it out. It's, it's you know, you can stream it on all the sites. It's free on YouTube and SoundCloud. So those are my three coronavirus quarantine tips. V, give us your three, and then let's get out of here. Well, I already gave one away, so I guess I'm going to have four. Get lucky. Okay. So. So the first one, obviously, You're always trying to one up me, man. Always trying. To <laughs> <laughs> Budgeting and saving is what I mentioned earlier. Learning how to do that um, mm-hmm. is important. You know, the second thing, you know, and you know, I'm a big advocate of this is, is just reading. Get a book, read, mm-hmm. educate yourself. Um, and you know, one other thing is build up your immuno, your immunity. Take vitamins. You know, one thing that can protect us all from sickness is is taking better care of our health. Um, and that means getting more vitamins, vitamin A, C, and D in particular. Um, and the final thing is go watch as many Michael Jordan videos as you can. <laughs> right. You want to learn, learn what to go. You want to learn about greatness. That's where you go. Yeah, no, that, that, that's good, man. So that's all we have for news and notes. Thank you guys for listening to pilot boys podcast episode 20. It's amazing that we've gotten 20 episodes in. You guys are great. Thank you guys for keeping us going. Uh, again, we will uh, be back and we're going to keep going. Uh, t- going to keep fighting through this quarantine situation to keep bringing content. That's all we have for today's show. Thanks to everybody for listening. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Subscribe to the Pilot Boys podcast on Apple, Spotify, Patreon, and YouTube. And please follow us on social media at Pilot Boys Pod on Twitter and at Pilot Boys Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. And follow the hosts on Twitter. I am at Mechadon Music and V is at This Swan. Always remember, be you. You is fly. Pilot boys out. Where the pilot boys at? Pilot boys, we get on up.